ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to City Club's Friday Forum. My name's Paddy Tillett, immediate past president of the club. Today we focus on a subject of great relevance following this summer's fires, sustainable management of Oregon's forests. Our experts today are Cassie Phillips, Vice President of Sustainable Forestry for the Warehouser Company, Dr. Jerry Franklin, Professor of Ecosystem Analysis in the College of Forest Resources at the University of Washington in Seattle, and Hal Salwasser, Dean of College of Forestry and Director of the Department of Forest Resources at Oregon State University. But first, of course, some announcements. Join us next Friday, November the 8th, for a blow-by-blow -blow analysis of the consequences of November 5th election with Tim Hibbets of David Hibbets and McCaig Incorporated. In addition to hearing Mr. Hibbets' observations, City Club members will be able to quiz him about other probable fallout of the elections. That'll be here at the MAC. Our annual fundraising campaign is well underway, and although the, we are over the halfway mark, we've got a long way to go. Whether you're a club member or a friend who benefits from what this amazing organization does to safeguard our civic values and widen our horizons, please fill out a pledge card today. There's one in the bulletin, and there are more at your tables. Our goal this year is $100,000, and we must achieve this if our valuable work is to continue. If you'd like to get a video or an audio tape of this or any other City Club program, you can do so through the club office. Video tapes are $20, audio tapes are 10 Call Suzanne at the office for more information. And do check out our website at www.pdxcityclub.org. Our board host, seated at the far end of the table, is Carol Witherell member of the Board of Governors and Professor of Education at Lewis and Clark College. She will have the privilege of asking the first question of our speakers. Following Carol's question, we'll open the program to questions from City Club members in the audience. Please line up behind the microphone on the floor while Carol's posing her question so that we can make the most of our panel's time. Please identify yourself as a member of the City Club and ask your question concisely. Broadcasting of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part by corporate underwriting from Pacific Care, from Pope and Talbot, and from the Warehouser Company Foundation. We are most grateful for their support. The first member of our panel to speak will be Cassie Phillips, who joined Warehouser in 1991 as Director of Environmental Affairs for Washington Timberlands. Four years ago, she became Director of Forestry for Western Timberlands with broad responsibilities for inventory management, harvest planning, land use and stewardship policies across Washington and Oregon. Now she's Vice President of Sustainable Forestry. Ms. Phillips followed a 1976 Bachelor of Science degree in Forestry with a law degree in 1982, both from the University of Washington. She practiced law with Perkins Coy and served as a legislative assistant to former Senator Slade Gorton before joining Weyerhaeuser. She's past president of the Washington Forest Protection Association and has served on the Washington Forest Practices Board. Much of Dr. Jerry Franklin's career was spent in the US Forest Service as a research forester. And after 35 years, he retired as chief plant ecologist. He's also been a teacher, spending 15 years as a professor in the College of Forest Resources at University of Washington. Dr. Franklin began his distinguished career as an undistinguished 16-year-old fire crew in the Columbia Gorge. Then he came to OSU to gain both a BS and a master's degree in forest management, moving on to Washington State University to complete his doctoral thesis in botany and soils. Dr. Franklin is noted for his work with old growth forest ecosystems, which he began in 1968, and he's had a major influence on policy through the Northwest Forest Plan and other avenues. Our third speaker is Hal Salwasser, who fills a triple role of Professor of Forest Resources and Forest Science, Dean of the College of Forestry, and Director of Oregon's Forest Research Laboratory at Oregon State University. He's also Acting Director of the Institute of Natural Resources at OSU. Before joining OSU faculty in 2000, Dr. Salwasser was Director of Pacific Southwest Research Station for the US Forest Service, and before that, he held a series of distinguished teaching, practice, and research positions in Montana, Washington, D.C., and California. He holds a BA in biology and a PhD in wilderness resource science from UC Berkeley. He's published over 70 papers, co-edited two books, was president of the Wildlife Society, and is a fellow of the Society of American Foresters. 
Dr. Salwasser has evidently discovered a way to stretch time because in addition to his triple faculty position, he serves on a whole series of boards, including the Forest Policy Advisory Committee for the Oregon Board of Forestry, the Board of Directors of the World Forestry Center, the National Commission for Science in Sustainable Forestry, and a whole lot of others that I won't list. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our extraordinarily distinguished panel and our first speaker, Cassie Phillips. Thank you, Patty, and I would like to thank the City Club for the uh, privilege to speak here this afternoon. Um, I, uh, uh, until very recently, was a resident of uh, Vancouver, Washington, just across the river, and so I've always told people I'm an Oregonian wannabe. Uh, we miss the Portland area very much, and it's a pleasure to be back here. I also have to admit to uh, divided loyalties being up here with Pal and Jerry. As Patty mentioned, uh, I have two degrees from the University of Washington and my husband has three degrees from the University of Washington. But last Saturday I attended the Oregon State University's football game and I have to tell you I'm uh, thinking of jumping ship. <laughs> I'm going to talk about Oregon's forests from a global perspective and start with a few facts about Weyerhaeuser. Um, Weyerhaeuser is I'm sure many of you know, uh, was founded here in the Pacific Northwest over a century ago, and it's grown to be one of the largest forest products companies in the world. We have about $15 billion in sales. We've been a Fortune 200 company since 1956, have almost 60,000 employees in 18 countries, and own a tremendous, own or manage a tremendous amount of land, uh, 1.2 million acres here in Oregon, seven and a half million acres across the United States, 34 and a half million acres across Canada, and another over half a million acres in the Southern Hemisphere between Australia and New Zealand and Uruguay. We're the third largest landowner in North America and the world's largest owner of merchantable softwood uh, timber. We have over 300 operating facilities and we're the world's largest producer of hardwood, both hardwood and softwood lumber, and the second largest producer in North America of structural panels, the largest producer in the world of, of uh, softwood market pulp, um, and I could go on and on. Now, you might ask, you know, given all that, uh, where does Oregon come in? And I'm here to tell you that Oregon is very important both to my company and to the world at large. It's important for two reasons. First, it's a terrific place to grow and harvest trees. And second, it's a proving ground for forest policy. First on the point about growing trees here. Um, growing trees, of course, and harvesting them has been a subject of controversy for a number of years. And some of you might wonder why we don't produce our forest products elsewhere and leave Oregon's forests to grow to a ripe old age. Um, and the answer is that, in part, uh, forests are not all created equal. I learned in forestry school at the UW that uh, Northwest Oregon and Southwest Washington have the most productive forests in the world. Now, that turns out to be an overstatement. <laughs> they have the most productive forests in the Northern Hemisphere. We can grow and, try and harvest trees here at rates, sustainable rates, that can meet a significant part of the world's need for wood on a relatively small footprint of land. If we were to stop practicing forestry here and try to meet the world's needs for, woods, for wood from slower growing forests in places like Russia, uh, Central Canada, Interior Canada, and the Nordic countries, then the footprint would be much larger, five to 10 times larger. Now, when I talk about these things, people sometimes think I mean it's an all or nothing choice. We either you know, har harvest everything off of a small area of highly productive forests, or we harvest everything off of large areas of low productivity forests, and of course that's not the case. Um, uh, but because some of the world's forests are highly productive, it gives us quite a few options in meeting the world wood demand. And I, I will comment that one of the options we're not using in Oregon is harvesting from federal lands. 
Timber sales off the federal forests in Oregon have virtually ended since the spotted owl controversy of a decade ago. U.S. Forest Service sales in Oregon were just under 3 billion board feet in 1990. They fell over 80 percent to half a billion board feet in 1991. That was a high point. Sales off the entire national forest system in Oregon have averaged about 50, 50 million board feet over the last four years each year. Now billions, millions, those sound like big numbers, um, but uh, one of the th challenges in forestry is our units are so small. A board foot is about the size of your dinner plate, if it were solid. And so 50 million board feet is about enough to keep one quite small sawmill running. So harvest, federal harvests in Oregon are, uh, as I said, you know, virtually, have virtually been eliminated, or federal sales. Which it goes into the point of Oregon being a proving ground for forest policy. Um, and I've been talking right now, really, from an old forest uh, policy model. The idea of, of forests either being uh, uh, managed at high levels of productivity for timber harvest or entirely put in reserves. Um, one of my colleagues calls this the, the parks and clear cuts model. Um, and Jerry, having worked these issues, and Hal too, for many years, is pro they're probably both sitting there wondering if I'm going to start calling old growth forests decadent and. <laughs> and argue that clear cuts are just the same as fire, so what's the big deal? Um, but I'm not. Um, that kind of one-size-fits-all, one management model for our forests is what got us into the troubles that we got into in the 1970s and the 80s. Um, we in the forestry world tended to take an intensive forestry model, an industrial model um, that had evolved after World War II, and apply it to all lands, public or private. Um, during, and that was, you know, in part what led to the spotted owl controversy and the reduction of federal harvest. Then in the 90s, we tried on other one-size-fits-all models, fits all models, searching for a silvicultural sil silver bullet that would buy us public approval and high harvest levels. Um, somebody said that, that the industry had gone through an identity crisis, and I think that's a good term. Unfortunately, there appear to be signs that our identity crisis is ending. A few years ago, the World Wildlife or the Worldwide Fund for Nature, World Wildlife Fund, sponsored a study called The Forest Industry in the 21st Century, in which they explored the question whether fast growing planted forests might produce a significant amount of the world's supply of wood in a relatively small area. Now, they were thinking about New Zealand, not Oregon. Um, and they, they, they haven't got their silviculture quite right, but it is still progress to have that discussion coming from a, a very important international environmental group. So while environmental groups might be conceding that forest management might possibly be a good thing, Weyerhaeuser and other companies are conceding that protected areas might possibly be a valuable part of local land use planning for forests. In British Columbia, for example, we participated in a land and resource management planning process that has allocated very large areas of old growth coastal rainforest to reserves. So there is room for different styles of forest management meeting different objectives in Oregon's forests. I've talked about two bookends, the intensive forestry model and a preserve model, but there's also room for less intensive, more natural management regimes that are suitable for family forest owners, for government agencies, and for other owners that don't have to seek the competitive rates of return that a commercial landowner like Weyerhaeuser has to seek. There's also a suitable model. This is also a suitable model for slow and growing, slower growing forests if, if costs can be kept low. There's also room for forest management for conservation purposes in which the removal of trees and making any money off of them is incidental to an underlying environmental purpose, such as restoring or protecting forest health. Um, I would love to go on and on about Oregon's uh, forest protection laws, which are among the toughest in the world. I could talk about forest certification. I could use up all of all the speakers' time on this subject, but this is time for me to stop, and I look forward to answering questions later. It's a real pleasure to be here today. I've so often listened to the, these forums on NPR, 
and always found them to be very enjoyable, so I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, none of us here have really conversed with each other about what we were going to say, and Brian actually gave us a lot of latitude in terms of what we might talk about. And I think you're going to find it interesting in some of the overlap. And one of the things that he did want me to address uh, were some aspects of the Northwest Forest Plan. And so I can start out with that. And you have to bear in mind I have a certain, you know, vested interest in the Northwest Forest Plan. And I'd like to just very quickly relate to you uh, some aspects of aspects of success and failure associated with that plan. Certainly, from the standpoint of ecological objectives, the Northwest Forest Plan has been uh, a success. If you're a spotted owl, if you're a Chinook salmon, if you're a small mollusk in a stream, you know, you're a lot better off today than you would have been without the Northwest Forest Plan. Uh, we just simply can't uh, debate that point. In terms of uh, legal success, again, at least for a brief period of time, uh, the Northwest Forest Plan achieved uh, a, a breaking of the gridlock that had occurred. And uh, it didn't last very long. It lasted basically until the salvage rider of 1994 put everybody right back in the trenches again. But at least initially it did what the president asked ecologically credible, legally viable. It also, although a lot of people don't think about this, uh, incredibly enough, this plan, which was just about federal lands, brought significant regulatory stability to state and private lands. And this is particularly the case in the state of Washington, less so in the state of Oregon. And how it did this was by taking such an incredible load of the conservation burden onto the federal lands, it made it possible for the state of Washington and a number of corporations to reach acceptable habitat conservation plan agreements that basically provided them with regulatory stability and allowed them to begin to go ahead, go ahead and operate. Also, uh, I won't go into details, but certainly the plan has accelerated uh, the development of scientific knowledge relative to uh, both the ecology and restoration management of our forests and streams. What hasn't worked? Well, right from the beginning, stakeholders at the extremes failed to get what they wanted. A lot of the environmentalists wanted all of the old growth set aside. That was not necessary to achieve, basically, the uh, legal requirements of protecting uh, northwestern species and ecosystems. Secondly, uh, the timber industry wanted timber harvest to continue at 3 billion board feet a year. That didn't happen. And what's gone on, then, in the subsequent decade has been a continuing effort by elements uh, on both extremes uh, to try to achieve their objectives through various other kinds of means. So uh, it didn't end the fight. Uh, another place uh, related to this was, of course, the plan has not produced the level of timber uh, harvest that we expected that it would be able to do. Now, I could go on some technical aspects of this for you and tell you, first of all, they never promised you a billion board feet, but it was nevertheless expected. And what, uh, we fa what the administration failed to do at the time that that plan was completed was to really seriously consider the impacts of some of the last elements that they added to the plan at the very end of the process they failed to consider what those were going to do uh, to potential harvest levels. And two of them had very, very significant impacts. Uh, one of them was the additional riparian buffering. The second was the survey and manage provision, which was not a part of the scientific process, which was added at the end. And as a result of that, and as a result of the litigation 
that came out of the salvage rider and an initial reluctance on the part of the agencies to really address the survey and manage provision. Uh, basically, uh, that is why we have seen such very, very low levels of cut uh, from the federal force in the last uh, four or five years. The other th aspect of the plan that's been a failure and a real disappointment to me has been with regards to the adaptive aspects of the plan. We really wrote a plan that was intended to be very adaptive so that as we learn more, we could change the plan and move ahead. Every single participant in the plan, from the agencies to the courts to the stakeholders, managed to wring out every bit of flexibility and adapt adaptation that was built into that plan. They did it, uh, among other reasons, because of distrust, because of fear and doubts about new knowledge. And I'm reminded of a, of a quote from a, a, a chapter that Norm Johnson at Oregon State University wrote, adaptive management has a ruthless hold on uncertainty. Well, who likes uncertainty, as inevitable as it is? So is it surprising that if you have a vested interest, you aren't really very interested in acknowledging and accommodating uncertainty? There are some lessons from our Northwest Forest Plan experience for fire and fuel issues. And, you know, they're very much on the docket right now. We're thinking about those a lot. There is a lot of relevant science and scientific consensus about the nature of the problem and what ought to be done with it, just as there was about owls and old growth. And let me suggest a couple of principles that I think you would have almost universal agreement from the scientist community on. First principle, any sound policy regarding fuels and fire suppression must reflect the reality that different forest types have different fire regimes and therefore require different fuel treatment and fire suppression policies. One size does not fit all. You know, that really isn't profound. Uh, fundamental, but not particularly profound. The relevance here, fuel reduction treatments are badly needed in forests east of the Cascade Range and on some sites in southwestern Oregon. Those pine and mixed conifer forests had pre-settlement frequent low to moderate intensity fire regimes. Suppression has drastically altered fuel loadings and created the potential for uncharacteristic stand replacement fires. On the other hand, throughout much of Western Oregon and certainly Western Washington, fuel reduction treatments are generally inappropriate, except for slash disposal following logging. We have not created uncharacteristic fuel loadings or the potential for unnatural fire behaviors through our fire suppression policies. Now, there are excellent scientific bases for recognizing and distinguishing those situations, but there is always this temptation by uh, the legislatures, by the, by the p politicians, to you know, look for that very simple sil silver bullet that's going to solve it all. Legislation that provides a universal prescription at the level of a national force, let alone the nation, is not based on sound science. And this applies as well to any legislation related to preserving old growth uh, or late successional forests. My second principle is a, a very brief one that I can provide for you. Where fuel treatments are carried out, the most important trees to leave behind are the large and old trees. They provide both the resistance and resilience to wildfire. In other words, they're the ones that are most likely to survive, and they're the ones uh, that are going to, by that process, contribute to the recovery. Removing large old trees is, in these east side fuel reduction treatments, is almost always undesirable from the standpoint of ecological values, potential wildfire impacts, and forest recovery. And what I'm talking about are those big, yellow-barked pine trees. 
Now, there are immense volumes of small and medium-sized material that, in my view, should be removed from the standpoint of ecological and fire perspectives, but they're not the big yellow bellies. And some of you may have picked up on uh, Mr. Bush's remarks when he left, uh, when he was at Medford, as sort of a parting remark that we're going to have to cut those big old trees in order to pay for this, because we can't afford to do the fuel treatments. Well, that's a little bit like uh, raising the village in order to protect it. Uh, I would like to have had an opportunity to say a little bit to you about the consequences of globalization of the wood products industry. And uh, Cassie got us started on that subject. And you need to understand that globalization of the wood products industry is the most important single factor that's going to influence our stewardship of forest lands in the next century, it, pardon me, in this century. And I'm very concerned that too many people are still focused on the old wars of the 20th century, timber versus preservation, and are not looking really seriously at what the consequences are as we have this tendency for the global wood products industry to move out of the Northern Hemisphere, to move out of the Pacific Northwest and to concentrate their activity in intensively managed exotic plantations in the southern hemisphere where you can get much better returns on investment and much lower per unit costs of production. Think about it. Think about a future without a processing industry in the Northwest. It's scary. And it's not really where we want to go from the standpoint of forward stewardship forest stewardship. Thank you. Well, Jerry, we're not going to go into that future where the Northwest doesn't have a forest processing industry, and I'm going to give you some thoughts on why I think that's the case. The forest cluster broadly defined as the forest ownerships, the manufacturing ability, and all of the related industries and uh, agencies is vital to Oregon's prosperity. In fact, it's foundational. While we don't uh, command the part of the economy that the forest clusters once did, uh, we're still uh, a supplier of about 60,000 jobs and uh, about $10 billion into the, the economic base. And uh, that amounts to, depending on which economist you talk to, as little as 10% and as much as 24% of Oregon's economy. Oregon has a tremendously rich forest endowment. 45% of the state's forested. That's 90% of what was here 100 years ago. We still provide about 5% of the United States softwood lumber supply. Much of this comes from the production forests, the industrial forests that Cassie mentioned. Uh, those occupy about 20 to 30 percent of Oregon's forest land base. That's a much larger proportion than occurs across the U.S. as a whole. And it's because of the growth potential that exists there. There are some challenges in this sector in maintaining uh, continued productivity improvement, maintaining a social license to use the practices that are necessary there. Oregon also has a significant role in the multi-value or the, the, the middle ground approach that Cassie mentioned. Uh, we have about 30 to 40 percent of our forest area that's, that's practicing multiple value, multi-use forestry. Most of it's the non-industrial private forests, the family forests, the state forests, tribal forests. Some of it is still occurring on the federal forests. There's a tremendous, uh, tremendously important roles for this sector to play. Uh, in providing the whole suite of forest benefits as well as some wood. The conservation forests, the, the natural reserves, are tremendously important. They're about 30 to 50 percent, depending on how you classify the lands. Most of these are on the federal forest, but some states and even some industry lands have places that are protected for their natural values. And our goals here are clear to, to maintain as much nature and natural process as we can, provide for some recreation. Uh, this is going to require some active management, though. 
in some places, we've got fire conditions in these forests that uh, are uh, pose threats to adjoining properties. They pose threats to communities, and they actually pose threats to the security of the natural resources that are on them in the first place. We have a, a globally significant forest products industry, produce tremendous quality products, very highly, uh, highly efficient, uh, and they're innovating in new kinds of engineered wood products. We have some threats. The high cost of the raw material that uh, Cassie mentioned, or that Jerry mentioned, is one of them. There are other places in the world that can produce wood cheaper, faster. We've got some uncertainty in regulatory and legal effects on private investments. We've got uh, non-renewable materials such as steel and aluminum making inroads into the, into the markets that uh, wood once occupied. Those are not nearly as environmentally friendly or renewable as the wood products are. And we've got some conditions on the federal lands that, uh, that are a real threat to, to the sustainability of our forest uh, forest health in the future. But we've got tremendous opportunities too. And it's these opportunities that are going to allow us to keep vitality in the, in the forest sector in this state. Because of the environmental practices that this state has had for many years, we can legitimately market our wood products as uh, higher value, uh, environmentally friendly wood. We can contain or reduce the costs of the industrial operations through technology. We can create new Oregon forest-based businesses and products by applying technology that is now available. We can engage federal agencies in actively participating in the various conservation strategies, such as the Oregon Plan. Uh, we can through the forestry program for Oregon, align the different ownerships to the various uh, desired outcomes that we have. And I believe that we can increase the adaptive management of our federal lands to reduce the risks that they have and provide sustainable flows of, of some level of uh, wood and jobs and services for our economy and our communities. But we're going to have to take a strategic view and line these things up. We can't just allow them to randomly happen. So as Oregon uh, gears up for the transition to a new governor, perhaps new legislative leaders, uh, it's, it's critically important that the forest sector play an active role in shaping the, the business plan, if you will, for the state of Oregon for its economic recovery. Build our economic development on a foundation of the conservation practices that this state is noted for. The Oregon plan for salmon and watersheds is a foundation of any economic recovery strategy that this state might entertain. Because if it doesn't work, the hand, heavy hand of federal regulation is going to make it even more costly to do business in Oregon. We can differentiate our products for market advantage. We can increase public investments for the private contributions to, to uh, conservation that we expect from pri private landowners. We can expand trade and export so that we can generate more wealth. And we can strengthen partnerships and uh, roles of federal land managers in, in the overall economic uh, recovery of this state. The federal lands uh, can once again become assets to the state's economy, not simply uh, drains on its economy that come every time we have a horrid fire season. But they won't be the same kind of assets that they were in the past. They'll draw from uh, more of the diversity of values that they have to bring. It's important that Oregonians begin to to once again view forests as a, a vital and prosperous part of their future, that it provides great jobs, it provides tremendous natural resource products, renewable products that, that uh, sustain our lives, and that forests are, are uh, perceived and understood to be a vital part of our economic recovery. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming to our City Club Forum today to share your perspectives on forest management. We live in a time of cultural divide in the Northwest. Um, whether you look at the rural-urban divide, um, timber folks and environmentalists, old comers, newcomers, pro and anti-globalists, and so forth. 
in a wonderful essay that I've gone back to so many times um, titled Voices of the Northwest, Kim Stafford suggests that the solution to environmental challenges are not only scientific, political, and economic, but they're also cultural. Our challenge as Northwesterners with very different interests then might be one of learning how to bring our divergent stories, traditions, and aspirations to a common table and then reason and vision together in response to a question like, what is this place we call the Northwest and what might it be? My question then is, how do we do this? How do we take on this civic and ethical challenge in an age of rising polarization of civic dialogue? What would it look like? Do we just randomly take a shot at this? <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, I'll take a stab. Um, I think it'll look like the Applegate Partnership down in southwestern Oregon, where people coming from many different uh, beginning points over the years have found a way to, to reach common ground on how to care for the, the lands that are in their, in their watershed. Uh, we have to enable the sort of local and regional collaborations that, uh, that occur uh, in places like that and that are called for in the Western Governor's uh, strategy that's known as in Libra. I, I, I guess I'll just comment that um, one of the things we learned in, uh, in our industry over the last decade was that we, we weren't very good at listening uh, to our stakeholders. We had a long tradition of being a pretty insular and rural-based uh, industry, and as the Northwest and the United States in general urbanized, we, we got pretty out of touch with public opinions and public values. And so we went through, um, you know, w w with not a small amount of pain and suffering, we went through the process of uh, clear cleaning out our ears and uh, holding public forums and engaging in, in uh, multi-stakeholder forums, some consensus-based, and, uh, and really listening to what people had to say. And, and that helped a great deal because it's uh, by listening and then really hearing, you can look at your own practices and think about what you need to do differently. And, and uh, it's part of the equation. The other part is leadership, which I, I think has to come from uh, the, the civic community from, and, and partly from government. Industry can't... Uh, can't really step out and try to lead things because we have our own obvious self-interests and academia, uh, at least the, scien the scientific side of it, can't do that either because um, their role is to contribute high quality information to decisions. So we're fortunate in Oregon that we do have a strong leadership structure. Um, Jim Brown, the state forester, and the relationships uh, with, uh, with OSU and, and uh, the civic community are very strong. So. There are opportunities. If, we're, if we can do it anywhere, we can do it here. Well, I, uh, to some extent, this relates a little bit to my comment about you know, the need for pretty localized uh, approaches uh, or maintaining at larger levels of policy the, uh, an ability to adapt to the local forest condition and to the local society, and I, I see this all as a part of a larger issue, which is the tension between larger societal objectives, for example, as reflected in national policy with regards to national force, and yet the need at the same time to provide flexibility for the local manager and for the local society to adapt that national policy to their circumstances. And it isn't just adapting to the natural, but also to the social. And I don't think we have really arrived at a good way of resolving that tension at this point. I do agree with Hal that, you know, approaches like the Applegate Partnership can be, you know, that's got to be a part of it. There's just no question. And yet, uh, in many respects, uh, the Applegate Partnership's been frustrated uh, by um, bureaucracy at times, uh, at times, in fact, by tensions within the local group. 
So uh, I don't think we have a, a, a prescriptive solution to how to resolve that conflict uh, between national or larger uh, societal direction and the need for uh, adjusting and adapting at the local level. But uh, certainly local-based efforts like the Applegate Partnership uh, have got to be a significant part of the solution. I'd like uh, each of the three of you to, to answer this question. Um, in a poll conducted by Tim Hibbett's firm last year, just about this time last year, um, one of the Achilles heels of the forest industry uh, was revealed, and that is clear cuts. Um, Mr. Hibbett's asked Oregonians what they felt of clear cuts, and the majority felt very strongly that they opposed them. And I'm wondering if, if, if the public is well informed about clear cuts. Uh, what can you tell us about clear cuts from a scientific standpoint and from a financial and economic standpoint? Uh, are clear cuts um, um, reasonably managed today from, a, from an ecological standpoint? And if not, can they be made so to be ecologically sound? And then secondly, what are the financial aspects of clear cuts? You know, are they required? from an industry standpoint to, uh, to uh, efficiently and effectively harvest timber? I'll let Jerry go first. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I waited till last, last time. Uh, I think you know, clear cutting is an example of a practice gone berserk and uh, justified through uh, when its, its basis is really primarily an economic basis when a, rather than a biological one, being justified on the basis of biology. And, you know, as Cassie suggested uh, in her introductory remarks, I, I must say clear cuts are nothing like most natural disturbances. Anybody that goes and looks at a fire or a, a wind throw event understands that. So they do not really follow a, a common natural model. They are an extremely efficient way of harvesting timber. They are a very efficient way of regenerating and growing a new crop of timber. But they have, because they uh, are as intense as they are and as thorough as they are and carried out uh, on a shorter rotation as they are, have extraordinary impacts on other forest values. Ecological functions, like productivity and regulation of the hydrologic cycle on habitat, meaning various kinds of critters. Uh, there just isn't a whole lot out there, uh, which is, of course, good for some critters and uh, not good for a lot of others. So uh, fundamentally, it is a practice uh, which has its basis in economics and in the fact that it's a very efficient way of growing trees. However, it is not necessary to clear cut in order to regenerate and grow Douglas fir, nor to harvest a timber stand. It just happens to be a really, really efficient way of doing it. The clear cutting is the um, sort of the great conundrum of practicing forestry in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, Hal mentioned that one of the one of the issues we have in the Northwest with forestry is, is we have very high costs here. And the good, the, that's the bad news. The good news is, is that we have a very valuable species called Douglas fir, which commands a high value in the marketplace. And Douglas fir, although Jerry is absolutely right that it's not necessary to clear cut to grow Douglas fir, Douglas fir grows a lot better under clear cut conditions because it's very light sensitive species. And so, um, from a rate of growth perspective, which is a very important thing when you think about forests globally, um, clear cutting is a tool that is, you know, very commonly used, and and not only in Douglas fir regimes, but in really most of the industrial forests in the world, clear cutting is the most common harvest method. As Jerry pointed out, it's efficient and uh, and lower cost, uh, but also it's it's not just the removal of the trees, it's also the importance of reestablishing the next forest and having it grow as quickly as we can. Now, having said that, of course, that it's not sufficient to stop there. Clear cuts, I, I haven't found one yet that is good looking. And, and 
it's, and I won't argue they are. They are ugly. They do have environmental impacts. Uh, they, you know, a, they carry a set of habitat conditions with them invariably. And then if done poorly, they can have a whole set of other impacts that, that are un very undesirable. So you know, we understand that. We've scratched our heads over the issue you know, many times. And one thing we know we have to do is we have to address, if we are going to keep the ability to clear cut, which is, which is really essential to, uh, to successful forestry, economic forestry here in Oregon, Western Oregon, um, we have to be able to, to assure the public that we're addressing the other issues. So water quality protection is extremely important. Biodiversity protection within the context of a larger landscape is very important protecting wildlife habitat attributes, which are, are there in clear cuts and can be enhanced um, with the right techniques, and then doing the best we can with the aesthetics. And so we're doing all of those things, and in Oregon we have a tough set of forest practices, uh, rules, and, and laws that, uh, that make those pretty widely enforced. So, you know, we do our best, but that's a dilemma that will always be there uh, in forestry in western Oregon and western Washington. I will uh, uh, add a um, a little different perspective. Uh, clear cutting as a silvicultural tool uh, for efficient wood production and regrowing of a forest has a role to play in the in the whole suite of, of practices that we have. Um, but it has a very distinctive role and is not appropriate in all cases and, and uh, certainly is inappropriate in, in many. The world uses about a billion and a half cubic meters of wood every year, industrial wood. That's about 40% more than we used 40 years ago, and we're heading into a future where we're going to use anywhere from 2 to 2.5 billion cubic meters by mid-century. That means we're going to have to find another 33 to maybe 66% more wood than we're growing and harvesting right now. And the uh, ability to, to do that is going to come from one of two sources. It's either going to come from more intensively managed forests on a relatively small total area, perhaps as little as 10% of all the forest land in the world, or it's going to come from harvesting more wood on about half the world's forests. So the policy choice that we need to, to think of is, are we going to try to meet most of the wood needs, the industrial wood needs, from a relatively small area, or are we going to scatter it around over a relatively large area? And when we think about the ecological impacts of clear cutting as part of that intensive forestry, we need to think not just of the impacts of that practice on that site at that time, but on the indirect effects of using that practice or not using it on what's happening throughout the rest of the forested landscape. It is not a simple issue of whether we like clear cuts or we don't like them. Bill Parrish, a City Club member. Um, of course, the big story in the last year was Willamette Industries, um, the hostile takeover by Weyerhaeuser, you hired the best public relations firm in New York, Joel Frank, the best one here in Portland, uh, Neil Goldschmidt's firm, and, and the rest is history. But my question is this. Um, to do that acquisition, Weyerhaeuser had to issue $5 billion worth of bonds. And Wall Street investment bankers made about oh, $200 million in fees. And what it means for the state of Oregon is that there's going to be dramatic structural decline in tax revenues over the next couple years. My question is, Boeing's already left its headquarters uh, from the uh, Tacoma area. Did Weyerhaeuser ever seriously entertain the notion of moving its headquarters to Portland to lower its costs? <laughs> well, you, you, if you remember from my introduction, I have a house in Vancouver, and I made that pitch to Steve Rogel personally, <laughs> but I didn't get anywhere with it. <laughs> Tom Dunn, City Club member. Um, the climate is warming. Uh, what are your clients, this is a question for all three of you, what do your climatologists tell you about the future of the forest industry in the Northwest, particularly the future of the Doug fir, which presumably has a, a climate range beyond which it will not uh, tolerate? Well, let me start on that. Uh, first of all, Douglas fir has a really wide ecological amplitude. So, uh, you know, it, c it can accommodate uh, substantial change in climate. I have a, another thing that I'm much more concerned about than uh, climate change. 
or global environmental change with regards to Douglas fir. And uh, I tell my students always, the greatest threat to the forests of the Pacific Northwest, indeed the greatest threat to native forests everywhere, is the potential for importing exotic pests or pathogens. And you know, all you got to do is look at the chestnut plight or the white pine bister rust or the Dutch elm disease. There's 25, 35 examples of where we have brought in pests and pathogens which have decimated, if not extirpated, important commercial tree species. Now, our commercial forestry depends on Douglas fir. Our native forests depend on Doug fir. I can't imagine how anyone that has a really serious concern about the forests of the Northwest can support the notion of the movement of live plants or unprocessed wood products between continents. So bottom line, the greatest threat to our forests is introducing new pests and pathogens. The vectors for that are bringing in living organisms or raw wood products such as logs, chips, or basically untreated wood products like crates from China. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Mark Tedesco. I'm a City Club member. And I have a question probably primarily for Jerry. Um, it seems much of the debate about forestry um, and the mechanics of forestry centers around issues like the riparian setbacks or fire suppression and these kinds of issues. And I'm wondering what other issues should we be cognizant of as, is, you know, as principal management tools to apply to forests for the future? I expect these other folks have some suggestions on that score. I, I managed to get in my favorite shot just previously, which is, you know, the first thing you do is you don't introduce any more virulent organism. But in terms of, of practices out there on the ground, I think we've got our eye on the right thing which is the aquatic ecosystems and the interactions between the forest and those systems, the rivers, the streams, the lakes, the ponds, the wetlands. And so, you know, if I had to start one place, that's where I'd start. And that's where you've started in this state with the Oregon fish strategy. It's where we have gone in the state of Washington with the Fish Forestries Agreement. That is the most important single interaction that we need to be worrying about. So the other thing is, again, something that people are doing more and more, and it relates to the clear-cut issue, and that is leaving some of the structures from the old stand behind when you do a regeneration harvest. You know, somehow we got the notion that we, we, we not only uh, must but, uh, you know, we're mandated to remove every piece of wood out there that you can pick up and put on a truck. And by leaving uh, structures of various kinds, I mean live big green trees and snags and logs out there, even in small numbers, I think we dramatically modify uh, the ability of the systems to, to carry out their functions. I would add to that, <clears throat> I agree with what Jerry said on the biological end of things. On the uh, tax and policy end of things, it's really important to maintain a tax structure that, uh, that encourages private forest owners to keep their lands in forest use because the alternatives of not having a forest are, are uh, not very uh, desirable from the standpoint of all the values that we get from the forest. And it's also important that the regulatory environment uh, encourage sustainable and, uh, and continual ownership of these private forest lands. They're uh, critically important, not only to the water uh, and wildlife, but also to the, the vitality and diversity of our, our rural communities. Jay Ward, and if the, if the paperwork went through, I'm now a city club member. Um, Professor Franklin, you uh, alluded to a, a time of reduced conflict uh, in early, the early 1990s that was uh, ended by the 94 salvage rider. I wonder if you, any of the panelists would uh, compare and contrast that with the executive and legislative attempts that uh, we're seeing out of Washington, D.C. right now. 
I could probably speak to that because I was a regional forester in the Northern Rockies that had to implement that salvage rider. And it was not a very uh, desirable piece of legislation to have to implement. Um, it is uh, some of the some of the appropriation riders that that were considered this summer prior to the Congress going into recess had had some things that looked kind of like that rider, but not all of them did. Uh, so th there's uh, there's not one size fits all on the legislation to deal with these fuel ca conditions in our forests, and it's critically important that that the legislative process, if it ever does finally come up with something, that it accomplishes several things. One is that the, the focus is on the ecological conditions of the forest that are created by whatever management activities are undertaken. As Jerry said, yeah, for, for the standpoint of fire, leave the biggest, oldest trees there. That it provide for a reasonable and meaningful citizen access to the policy or the planning process. And that doesn't always have to be at the tail end taking people to court. It can be at the front end helping to design in a collaborative way. And the third is um, that it's got to be an affordable process, that we haven't loaded up uh, whatever it takes to design these projects with so much uh, process and analysis that we, we simply don't have enough dollars to, s to spread across the landscape to get the kind of work done that has to be done. And if the, uh, if the legislative process can kind of adhere to some of those principles, not exempt things from environmental laws, not take people out of the process, not go after something that isn't ecologically sound, then, then it won't look like the salvage rider and it won't behave like it either. And I'll say amen to that and hope that that's the way it works. I just have to observe that some of the same <coughs> minds that were behind the salvage rider, uh, Senator Craig from Idaho and his associate Mark Ray, who's now the deputy uh, uh, Secretary of Agriculture that handles the Forest Service, those were the minds that gave us the salvage rider. And so, you know, I'm more than a little concerned, particularly when it comes to issues related to modifying the Northwest Forest Plan. The last thing we want is for that plan to go back into uh, a train wreck. We have too many habitat conservation plans and other agreements that are founded on that plan. And we simply can't put it at risk for the small amount of timber that's involved, I think. Aubrey Russell, a city club member, a reference was made to the Oregon plan for salmon. Um, my understanding is that natural resource agencies commit to a number of measures under the Oregon plan um, my question is, what has the Department of Forestry committed to? Um, I'm, I imagine there are quite a few of these, but what, in your view, um, which measures offer the greatest hope for restoring salmon um, and other threatened species on a statewide, on a watershed-wide, on a landscape-wide scale? What are, say, three measures that offer the most hope? Um, and what has, what has the Department of Forestry done to actually implement these measures on the landscape in a way that is yielding results in, in really sort of in hard terms. Thanks. I'll take a stab at that. Uh, I'm not a Department of Forestry person, but I work pretty closely with them. Uh, first, the critical factors for the recovery of salmon um, are, are, for the most part, are not on the forest. They're out in the oceans, the harvest, the hatchery programs, the hydropower dams. The things that the forest sector uh, can do and, and is doing uh, relate to the, the, the kinds of vegetative structures that are left along the streams, the riparian zones, what is done with roads and the, and the culverts and the bridges that cross roads so that uh, sediments don't go into the streams. And those have all been adopted uh, uh, in the forest practice rules uh, for the state of Oregon and the, the uh, forest landowners have uh, very aggressively uh, voluntarily gone after taking the, the the actions that are necessary to improve the roads and to maintain the aquatic uh, uh, conservation areas. There is still uh, some likelihood that they'll, they'll take in increased measures in that, and that's kind of going through the rulemaking process right now. The, the only thing I would add is um, j just based on the things that we're doing on our land, Hal is right, 
Um, good riparian management and roads are extremely important. There's also a tremendous amount of, of stream and habitat restoration activity going on, particularly removing old uh, stream crossing structures, old culverts, old, you know, some of which date back, you know, a century or more, and replacing them with modern bridges and culvert designs that, that can free up stream for fish passage that might have been blocked before. And there's I, I, tens of millions of dollars being spent on that across uh, Western Oregon and Western Washington, and I'm sure East Side too as well, um, with some very, very positive and very tangible results. This will be our last question. Can I, I, I just wanted to ask a follow-up, because I didn't hear any reference to measures that the, the Department of Forestry has committed to under the Oregon plan. And I don't know if, I don't, perhaps we're not, okay. Monroe Sweetland, member of the club. I tried during the last year or so, when I had lots of time to sit around and read, and have read to me, but I heard no reference to something that continually came up in what I did read. Did read. I don't think the word Tongass, or the reference to the Tongass forest, has come up in this discussion today. Is it, therefore, an insignificant part of the forest, Western forestry picture? Also, I wanted to ask, somewhat in connection with that, is there any hope or is there importance to international agreements is there a role for the UN? What about West, about East Asia? What about our Alaska relatives? Uh, have we, can, can we, by broadening our scope, get better results than we can through Oregon plan or Idaho plan? Okay, the, uh, the, the Tongass you referred to, the Tongass National Forest in it's southeast a, Alaska? It's a big issue in this year's Alaska elections. Oh, oh okay. I don't even hear them referred to here. Right. Well, we were talking about the, the Oregon-Washington part of the northwest. The, the Tongass is, uh, is southeastern Alaska. And, um, but it is U.S. policy. It is in U.S. federal forest policy, correct. Where does the it the part in? of your question that, that I think is really important is... is is what institutions of governance or markets uh, can do on the uh, on the global scale to uh, get a better uh, a rationality to forest management and, and global trade and uh, the UN probably doesn't have much of a role because it's a relatively ineffective body in in terms of, of figuring these sorts of things out what is what is much more effective are the the uh, arrangements that are uh, that are occurring under the sustainable forest management policies uh, programs that are that the countries have voluntarily agreed to develop and uh, to develop for themselves and in the marketplace the development of